I worked for a company in Richardson, and so I was the lead therapist at the counseling center and ended up becoming the assistant clinical director. I worked really closely with the psychiatrist. I got to learn a lot about meds, plus I had my own individual caseload. On this episode of the Compassion Works Way, we'll hear Jordan speak to Caroline Koblinski. Caroline is the owner and founder of CWK Counseling and is a licensed professional counselor, licensed chemical dependency counselor, and EMDR certified. She's specializes in trauma, family dynamics, life skills and management, and conflict resolution. Having spent a fair amount of time as a client in therapy, Caroline knows how hard the work is, and creating an environment where people feel safe to journey through the struggles, big and small, is what she's passionate about. In this episode, Caroline walks us through her journey of starting a private practice, trainings she has received that helped expand her knowledge, and ways of becoming an EMDR certified therapist. You can learn more about Caroline by visiting our website, CompassionWorks.com, or Caroline's practice, CWKCounseling.com. Now let's get into the episode. Welcome to the Compassion Works Way, featuring insightful discussions, inspiring stories and expert interviews on mental health, building your practice, and personal and professional growth. This show is brought to you by Compassion Works, your hub for therapists, mental health professionals, and seekers of holistic healing. Your host, Jordan Schaefer, founder of Compassion Works and licensed EMDR therapist. Together, we'll create a world where compassion and understanding transform lives. Compassion Works, empowering therapists and transforming lives. Now let's get into the episode. Okay, well, uh, and what I wanted to talk about was it would be, um, I think there are two things. One, you have a private practice, right? I do. So I think people are interested, people starting out in how to start a private practice. Okay. So that could be one topic. And then another one is, uh, you know, it's, since you became EMDR trained, how did that? How did EMDR change your practice? So those okay, two things. Yeah. Okay. But but before we get to that, tell me a little bit about yourself, like uh, when you became therapist and what. what so that kind of thing. I um I did my intern hours in 2017 and 2018 and got fully licensed 2018. We did. Okay. Uh, and so um, I started working out. I started working um, in an inpatient kind of facility. So I spent, um, I got all of my hours in the shortest amount of time that you could do because I was lucky enough to get a paid internship. Um, so I got fully licensed at the end of 2018 and I went through EMDR, the basic training, I guess in 2017, maybe that summer, I think, um, when it was in, um, at that hotel that's on like park or Parker or something. I think that's when it was. No, Brittany was in the first one, but I don't, I guess I don't remember if she was, Brittany was still there with you when I did basic training. Yeah, probably. So the Holiday Inn may be on. Yes. Could be that. Or was it in Plano or Allen? I think it was in Allen. Oh, it was. I've done other trainings. I've done other trainings with you in Plano, but I think that one was in Allen. Oh, okay. Okay. Low these many years ago. Um, and so since then I've done four or five advanced trainings with you, I think. Um, with Compassion Works. Yeah. Probably AJ Popke and maybe Rush. I missed out doing his. I did um with, is her name Esley? I don't know how you Esley. pronounce it. Esley. Yes. I did with her and then I did um, with Roger Solomon and then I did um, the one with Amanda, what's her face, the history taking. Um, Amanda Martin. That, that was yes. online, I think. Yes, that was online. That one hadn't been that long ago. And then I've done a lot of Laurel Parnell stuff. I've done two or three of hers. 
Okay. But basically, uh, as a therapist, you really always use DMDR, at least in private practice. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, I would say that it definitely, I was laying in bed last night trying to think of answers. Um, I would say that the whole EMD mo model, EMDR model, that three pronged approach, that EMDR very much lines up with my kind of philosophy on counseling anyway. Um, and so getting more training, I think has just made, even when I'm not doing EMDR, I'm using EMDR techniques with people, um, regardless of whether or not I'm doing bilateral mm -hmm. simulation. Um, so yeah. Well, see, so, but you consider yourself an EMDR therapist. Is that mostly what yes. you do? Or? I don't know if that's mostly what I do. Okay. I would say it's probably half of what I do. Um, but the rest would be talk therapy. Um, and I've also done some IFS stuff. And so I think that that kind of, you can use that in EMDR. And so I do that. Yeah. That's good. Uh, so, yeah. Well, how, how has it informed your private practice? I mean, does it help um, trauma, that kind of thing or? Yes. I think just in general, the way that I approach my clients is very EMDR informed just because of the way that, um, I guess case formulization is really, that's one of the big things that I've taken away from EMDR is how do you do that in a practical way that feels, um, kind of authentic and flow worthy. Um, I think EMDR has, again, I, it lines up so much with kind of the way I do counseling anyway, but figuring out chronological order of stuff, I feel like EMDR has helped me do that in a more effective way. Um, and thinking through, okay, what's the first and the worst. And then, um, also, and thinking of how we set up targets to think through, okay, what are the main themes here kind of throughout their lives and what are the different situations that have, you know, been kind of created or self-fulfilling prophecies from that. Um, and, and then also their life, you think, or directed their life. Yes. I think that I, definitely kind of in the beginnings of stuff and trying to figure out what the themes are. Like, obviously they send in their paperwork and that kind of stuff, but, um, figuring out in the first couple of sessions, what are the main themes that we're working on? Um, and then categorizing case plans, case note planning, um, based on that is more kind of, and at this point I can do it in my head, but at the beginning, I definitely, my notes were much more probably structured than they are now. Um, but, and also one thing that Esley that I like really love is instead of the negative belief, she would say, what is the lie that you have believed? Um, and so after you got the negative cognition, she always referred back to is the lie that you have believed. Um, and I think that that just really reinforces like that that's not true just with that verbiage. Um, and so that's definitely something that I use, okay. you know, whether I'm doing EMDR or not. Um, it's funny how we pick up different things. I don't remember that, but. Yes, she, her stuff was so, um, I think between her and Laurel Parnell, the creativity part of EMDR has been really, really helpful to me. Okay. Uh, with, you know, in the beginning, I think of EMDR as you have to learn to paint by numbers. And so you're going through the eight phases really 
strictly and you're not having interweaves and all of that kind of stuff. But then as you do trainings, as you get more information about it, you figure out like the art form of EMDR. Um, and so I think different, I think that's why it's important to continue to do different protocols and learn different protocols. Um, because you figure out what works for you. And then once you have more information, if you need to kind of pivot within a session, you can do that. Um, so that's my big thing. I think, um, I have definitely when I started, I had a lot more, um, trying to think of my first EMDR clients. It was just a lot. Um, it was way different than the experience I have of EMDR now um, with my clients, just as far as being able to keep things contained and um, seeing when clients are like when they're telling when clients at the beginning, you know, everybody is scared that they're going to do EMDR incorrectly. Um, and so that's kind of a hump that you have to get over. And I think that really doing psychoeducation in the beginning with people is really important to try to reassure them, um, of things. I also think it's really important for EMDR therapists to have done their own EMDR work because then you can explain it to your clients. Um, and depending on, you know, how much self-disclosure you have, you can explain from your personal things, or you can explain it from a point of, you know, this is what happened with another person. But I think it's really important to be able to give them examples that you have experienced, um, to reassure your clients that they're doing it well. Um, I think the other thing that happens is you start to, Oh, you told me about that training that I never finished, but the window of tolerance. Yeah. I thought that was really, really good about being able to, um, being able to notice when your clients are moving in and out of that and when it's okay. And when it's not, that was the great uh, pinner. Yes. Training, right. Yeah. Workshop. It's online. Good. Okay. Yes. So he gives you information uh, on how to see, how to actually interact with clients to know if they're moving where they are in the yeah. window of tolerance. Yes. I thought that was a really helpful one. Oh, good. Well, and again, that's one that I use even when I'm not doing BLS with people, like just working with people. I mean, I think that's another way that EMDR really informs the way that I do therapy, um, is just these different techniques, um, that you need, you know, in everyday counseling. Well, and we think of EMDR as more than just the bilateral stimulation. Bilateral, um, yes. We think of yeah. it, it's more than just a standard protocol. It's the history, the way you take a history, how you get clients ready to do the work. Yes. And what you do after yeah. you've done it, all that's really a, a method through which you operate or a treatment model. Yes, that's kind of the nuance. Yeah. And you work from that. Yeah. But it, so in your um, training to become a therapist, basically, did, did you work in a hospital then? Is that what I... I worked um, for a company in Richardson that it they have three sober living homes um, and then a clinical a counseling center. Um, and so I was the lead therapist at the counseling center and ended up becoming the assistant clinical director while I was there. Um, but I worked because of the way the program was set up. I worked really closely with the psychiatrist. And so I got to learn a lot about meds and, um, that kind of thing. Um, and so it was, it wasn't impatient, but it kind of almost was just because of the level of involvement. I ran the IOP program, which was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine to 12, 
um, and wrote that curriculum. Um, and so I was interacting, plus I had my own individual caseload. Um, and then we, I would do weekly phone calls with family members. So I also did a lot of family work. Um, okay. there. And at that, at that time though, you were not doing EMDR, is that right? I was doing EMDR. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. um, that, so I got, I got, I did EMDR during my intern hours. Um, and so I was doing EMDR oh, yeah. the whole time I was oh, there. Okay. Um, and one thing that I ended up doing, I've done some sand tray, um, sand tray work. And during one of the things that I was doing while I was doing sand tray stuff, that's when I did, or before then at some point, that's when I did Esley's thing. And so in working with populations where you're kind of having to beat people into submission to do therapy, you have to get creative. Um, and so when I would start with EMDR and get people, um, to kind of, you know, people that are not willing participants in therapy, I would get them to create situations with a sand tray. And then that would be the picture that we would use to start processing. Okay. Um, so that was another, you know, creative way to get people prepared to start EMDR. Um, so I've been using EMDR techniques and doing EMDR the whole time I've been oh, in yeah, practice. Okay. Okay, yeah. uh, and that's Esli Carvalho. Uh, yeah, she's in Brazil, but I, th I think you can find trainings that she does online. Basically, uh, she's very cre creative, right? Very creative. That like museum protocol. I thought that that was really really good. <laughs> um, her way that she draws the brain, I think, is really helpful. Um, trying to think, what else? She used a lot of drawings with her stuff um, and coming from the background that I have come with, with working with kids, I know a lot about kind of the way our brains engage, which I also think is really important with the EMDR of explaining to clients left and right brain and how stuff is stored within the hippocampus and like all of that. So knowing the really kind of biological way that EMDR works and explaining the amygdala and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I think she had quite a bit of that in hers. Um, Janina Fisher is another one that I did a really, I did like a 50 hour training with her through PESI. Um, and she does EMDR. Um, I've learned a lot from her. Okay. Very okay, good. <clears throat> so you're in a private, you have your own private practice, right? Yes. So Don't I went into... I went into full-time private practice in 2022 or 2021. Well, 2020. 2021. Yeah. Yes. Cause that would be, yes. Cause I'm starting my third year or I'm halfway through my third year. So 2021, 2022, um, so you went from working for that company to private practice. Is that what? Yes. Um, and I was lucky enough that she would allow me to, by the time I quit working there, I had built up a caseload of probably 15 people. So I started seeing private clients, I guess right before the pandemic. So I started seeing private clients probably beginning of 2020. Um, and then by the time I went into full-time private practice, I had built up a caseload. And so that was, I was seeing people in the evenings and on Saturdays. Um, so that was how I transitioned did you work in a group or by yourself? I worked by myself. Okay. Um, 
And so, what was your step yeah. one? What did you do? You, you got, did you rent an office and uh, what did you do? I know I worked out of, she let me work out of my office, oh. which was really, I mean, God just totally was faithful to me and all of that. I did, um, I did at the beginning, I would do a little bit of office sharing. I had a friend that had gone into private practice and her, uh, her office was not far. And so, um, she would let people rent out her office on the weekends. Um, and so sometimes I would do it there. I mean, I think that's probably the way to go if you can financially do it on the different, um, on the different DFW counseling pages, there's people on there all the time that are posting offices that are for office share and you can rent them, you know, by the day, it's like a hotel, you can rent it by the hour. Um, but you can, um, there's people on there that are always saying that they have offices for rent you know, for part-time to do office shares. And I would think, and they're usually really nice. And so, um, I, that to me would be the way to go. If you're not, you know, especially if you're not in the counseling field or don't have somebody like me, that's going to let you use your office. Um, so that would be, I think the easiest and most economical way to start. Okay. And, um, any other tips for people starting out? Um, I would say to make sure, even if you're done with your supervision hours, to find some sort of consultation group to be a part of. Um, because especially in the beginning of private practice, it can be really scary and really isolating. And so now with the pandemic, there's so much, there's so many online things that you could be doing a consultation group with. Um, and that's one of the things I really liked about Compassion Works is the way that they connected you with consultation groups. Um, cause there's still some people that I talk with from doing that. Oh, okay. Um, so I would say for sure, make sure that you're connected with a group of people that you can bounce ideas off of, that you can do case conceptualization. Um, I would try real hard to find a mentor, um, that even if it's like you're paying them to be your mentor or something like that, um, to find a mentor, um, I would say another thing that's probably helpful in the very beginning is talking to someone that knows about small businesses, um, because they're going to be able to help you set your practice up in a way that works. Um, Another thing that we have an accountant that does all our taxes and she set my company up, my father-in-law set up my PLLC, which is good because I'm just an employee. And so if anything goes wrong, people can sue me, but they can only take like the stuff in my office. So my, I, um, I'm an employee of CWK counseling. Um, and so then our accountant set, um, set up CWK as an S corp. And so that has a lot of tax benefits, um, of being able to write stuff off and you're an employee of the company. And so that keeps your taxes that you have to pay and all of that it makes it much more manageable at the end of the year. Um, so, um, there's a lot of tax benefits to being an S corp. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Uh, I didn't know that. Yes. Cause you're an employee of your company. So like last year I didn't end up owing because I paid taxes. Um, I paid taxes, obviously like payroll taxes throughout the year. And I didn't end up owing any taxes for CWK last year. Cause I was able to write everything off. Um, so there's big, 
incentives to doing that. Okay. Um, so I think that's another thing that people are always asking about on the Facebook pages is finding an accountant that knows about counseling and small businesses. I think that's important. Laurel Clements is another gem of a resource. She's an LPC and an attorney. Um, and she does CEUs. She probably does one every month. Uh, and they're like $20 or something. Um, and they're really helpful. And she is very knowledgeable about stuff. Um, I think as far as, you know, working with the board, the number one thing that gets people to have their license removed is sleeping with their clients. Um, which seems like that would be such a, like, how would that even happen? But I mean, literally, if you go through and look at the reasons people have lost their license, the majority is because they were having an inappropriate um, relationship with their client. And so having really good boundaries there, I think is really important. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that was helpful to me in the beginning. Um, figuring out if you're going to take insurance or not, if you are going to take insurance, you have to be able to float yourself for quite a while before you start getting reimbursed for those sessions. Um, which is why I don't take insurance. Um, but in not taking insurance, I also have a certain number of sliding scale people. And then I have two people that I see completely for free. Um, so figuring out financially, okay, how much do I need to make every week or every month? And then breaking that down by, okay, I'm going to charge this much. And then that tells you how many clients you need to see. Um, and then that can determine how many people you have on sliding scale. Oh. If you choose to do that. Um, so you've never taken insurance? Never taken insurance. And that's the other thing is it, it's impossible. And I think you told me this, it's impossible to get off of those panels. Like I think one time you told me you still have people that call and you're like, no, I haven't taken insurance in like 15 years. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it can be. Yeah, one I couldn't get off of. I don't know, which means you can't take their clients' private pay, right? Legally, yeah. So that's weird. Um, um, so how do you so, get your clients? Where do, where do your clients come from? Um, I would say the majority of my clients are word of mouth. Um, I have done. I've made some really good relationships with other therapists that I get referrals from, but I like the majority of my clients come from other clients, telling them about them, telling me, telling them about me. Um, and people that have seen me previously will recommend me, or I have people, you know, that know each other. Um, I also see families because I have a master's in marriage and family therapy. And so I see couples and families um, and coming, I think that MFT kind of standpoint, that's the way that's kind of one of the tenets of the way that I practice. And so, um, you know, I think that it depends on the therapist if you can, because your job in therapy is to align with your client. And so if you're there, you know, as a, there as a couple, your alignment is with their relationship. That's what you're doing. But, um, depending on your ability to separate, I like, I see different members of families. Um, like I have one family that I've been working with right now that I see the mom, the son and the daughter, and I do family work with them. Um, but some therapists, they wouldn't be able to like compartmentalize that. And so that wouldn't be a good fit for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it just kind of depends. Um, 
on how you do with compartmentalization. I think that's another thing that therapists need to, therapists need a therapist um, because secondary trauma is a very, very real thing. Um, and especially when you start out with EMDR, um, I, when I started seeing clients that had had sexual abuse, I remember the, um, first client that I saw that had, um, been sexually abused as a child, it was really, really, really hard for me. Um, and so, you know, as you get more complex cases, as your skin kind of thickens to them and your skin is never fully thick just because countertransference is a real thing. Um, but you know, especially with EMDR because it's trauma focused, like that's the whole thing that we're doing. And so having your own therapist, I think it's really important. Um, and that's the other thing I think you need to have done your own work before. And that's one of the things that hopefully they're learning in grad school, because if you get in to therapy and like so many people get into this field, cause they're, you know, they want to fix themselves. Right. Um, and so if you haven't done your own work, you're going to be reenact reenacting and working out your stuff on your clients, which is extremely unethical. Um, and if you have trigger points that you haven't worked through, clients are going to come in and they're going to trigger you. Um, and so I think that that's another really big thing to make sure that, especially when you're starting out, um, which again, is I think why it's really helpful for therapists to have done EMDR because it gives you a whole different appreciation for the process. Um, and what clients are going through. And then when you need to go work with your therapist, um, that's another thing is I think that it's really important to, uh, to find a therapist that does EMDR for yourself because they're going to be able to, again, help you with that model um, and kind of the way that they're working with you. I just think the EMDR, it works for everything. Um, and so, um, yeah, as you're talking, I, I'm thinking it helps see your own complexity, the complexity of life experience. Yeah. From other than just talking about things to make it better, that somehow there's a complexity yes. that is addressed through doing uh, EMDR. Well, and I think that the thing that really blew my mind when I very first started is that you are bringing something to your clients that is going to give them true relief. Like I know that I was in therapy. I was in therapy off and on for 17 years working through stuff with my mom. And then, um, I was a guinea pig demonstrator, um, the first weekend with, um, Brittany and we did, um, I did work around my mom. And I mean, that still is something that I, you know, that still is life changing to me. Oh, really? That one session? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, That's pretty, it is amazing, right? When it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that talk therapy isn't helpful because I had a ton of insight into doing that. And so, you know, a 30 or 40 minute deal, um, I had all the tools I needed to go in and do that, which is, I think why preparation and history taking and all of that is so important because it, in, it helps your clients to be more informed when they do EMDR, um, I think that that's, you know, really important. Now, are you a consultant? Did that ever come through or I don't remember? No, because I couldn't figure out how to make it worth my while to find people to do groups. Um, but I mean, also you would probably just learn a ton from doing CIT stuff that even if you didn't have a group, I mean, that would be helpful. 
Um, well, in talking so, to you, it seems like you'd be a good person to consult with. I guess you can uh, still do consulting, right? You, I mean, I do have people, especially that are starting out with EMDR that know how much I love it and know how many different trainings that I have done. And I do get people asking me questions, um, which I guess is consultation. I probably shouldn't be doing that, though, should I? I'm not, I'm not certified to do that. You can do that. Um, yeah, you can give you can give ideas. No, um, I'm sure. But yes, I love talking EMDR with people um, because I think you just learn so much from the way other people do therapy and you can kind of get those nuggets from different people. Um, I did. So I did my first 10 hours or nine hours. I don't know. I did the first part of my hours with um, Compassion Works and with Vanessa Vodder. Is that how you say her last yeah, name? Right. Um, I did with her. And then the rest of them I did with Carrie Foote, um, who she is so skilled in EMDR. I learned a ton from her. Um, so she was another person that somebody told me about in a compassion works, um, because there's different, she had help with trainings. Okay. Um, you met her at one. She, um, that's the other thing that I think is really cool about EMDR is it's not people's personal therapy philosophies are there. So you are getting um, different people's, the way that EMDR fits into their specific um, theoretical point of view. And so I think that that is really helpful um, in, in learning how to do EMDR for you once you have that with standard protocol. Um, so, yeah. What, what other trainings do you think? So if somebody's a new therapist coming out of uh, grad school, starting out, you know, they, they, they know they need to learn more than what, you know, which is always the case. What, what kind of yeah. uh, trainings would you point them to or areas of interest? Uh -huh. EMDR related or just in general? I think in general. I mean, we're assuming people would want to take EMDR, but maybe not EMDR. everybody. Uh, but, I think Gabor Mate, I've done several of his things. Oh. Uh, I think that he and his videos that he has on YouTube, I think are really helpful from the way that he views trauma. And I mean, his whole thing is compassion. And so um, I think he's a big one. Um, who else have I done that I really liked? I really liked his stuff. I really like Dick Schwartz and his um, parts work, I think is a really good that just, I think, is a really good way to inform therapy because through through thinking of different parts of whether or not you're doing IFS work or not. Internal family systems. Right. Clients, yes, internal family systems. Um, allowing clients to kind of see these different parts of their personality, I think, is really empowering because it's like you are, you can be a conglomeration of all of these things and these different parts of you, there's no bad part to all of these things are coping mechanisms. And so helping clients to understand that I think is really empowering. Um, what else? I think motivational interviewing, if you can find some sort of workshop on that, that is huge. Um, Oh. Because that just does, I think that's just really helpful information to have. Um, I think everybody needs to do some kind of training stuff and substance use because it's just so pervasive 
you know, if it's not your client that has substance use abuse or disorder, their family member does, or their husband or somebody does. And so everybody needs to have a basic understanding of addiction. Okay. Good idea. Um, yeah, I would say those are kind of my big psychedelics is another one that's coming into vogue. And so having some understanding of that, I think is interesting and is going to be more important um, as time goes on, especially with ketamine clinics popping up um, and having some information about that. So I get a lot of clients asking me about that. So having some sort of information to give them or, you know, pointing them in a direction. Um, I think those are probably my big ones that I would say. Okay. Well, that's great. And I think we kind of need, we're coming up on the time okay. here, so we need to wrap. Yeah. Uh, but really, that's been a lot of information. Uh, and you're available for consultation, I guess? People. Yeah, I love to, I love to do all of this stuff. I love to talk therapy. So I want to be careful. Anybody, so I noticed you have Carolyn Kublinski here, but you go yes. with Carolyn Watson, right? I know I have, since I didn't get married till I was 33, I just sign everything as Caroline Watson Kobolinski because people know me as Caroline Watson than other people since I've gotten married that I've met. Okay. Um, so I go by Caroline Watson Kobolinski. Okay. And then are you, you're an MS? An MA. I have a master's, I have a master's in counseling and a master's in family, marriage and family. And then LPC? Yes. Okay. LPC, and I also have my LCDC license. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure I get that correct. So. Yes. Okay. So, well, thanks a lot. That was I, a world of information. Okay, good. I'm doing supervision training in September, so... Hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have, I'll be an LPCS. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So that's my thing that's in the pipeline. Okay. Um, but yeah, I love when people reach out to me and we can talk through stuff. Cause I think there's a lot of bad therapists out there and you don't want to be the one that messes up your client. Um, and so making sure that you're having good people that are pouring good things into you, I think is really, really important. Okay. All right. So, and you, you're, okay. are you on psychology today? Probably. I'm not, I was oh. on there for a while and I wasn't getting, it wasn't helping me at all. Oh, oh. Um, but yes, my, Website is cwkcounseling.com. Um, and that has all my information on it and some different blogs that I've written. There's actually an EMDR blog that I wrote um, that I think is really helpful just in kind of helping people get um, helping people get verbiage to use. And that stuff that I got from Compassion Works, I think that I wrote that with so okay yeah what's your website again cwkcounseling.com cwk counseling okay yeah all right well thanks a um, lot that's great yeah i'm happy to okay um i can't wait to read this when it comes out it's gonna be uh I don't, it, it'll be audio video oh awesome you'll be live and in person Okay. I'll make sure. I'm glad I didn't curse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. See ya. Okay. Bye. Bye.